All right, thank you. I am delighted to introduce three amazing panelists, each of whom has written about same-sex marriage from a different perspective, and those perspectives will become clear as each of them talks. I should note that uh, the last time I was at New America, I was on a panel with someone who was opposed to same-sex marriage. Their three different perspectives on same-sex marriage are all very, very supportive. It's just sort of different takes on the very supportive same-sex marriage. Um, it's, of course, timely to be talking about same-sex marriage because according to the Pew Research Center's latest poll, 72% um, of Americans say legal recognition of gay marriage is coming. And even people who are opposed to it still believe overwhelmingly that it is on its way. Um, OK, so starting, starting here with, with Martha Ertman, um, Martha Ertman is a law professor at the University of Maryland. And excuse me for going into the personal, but she and Karen were married. 2009. 2009. In Massachusetts. But by the time we got back to DC, DC recognized that it changes very fast. While you were en route? Almost. Um, uh, and she is also, she's interweaving, the reason I feel okay bringing up the personal, she's, she's interweaving her personal experiences with a book that she is currently writing that's called Love and Contracts, The Heart of the Deal. Um, Liza Mundy, I, I, who is... Well, she's written many, many different things um, uh, in addition to the richer sex and everything conceivable and Michelle. One of the reasons that she stands out for being on this panel is that most recently in the June issue of The Atlantic, she wrote a really, really fascinating article on same-sex same marriage and in which she talks about um, it's called The Gay Guide to Wedded Bliss. Research finds that same-sex unions are happier than heterosexual marriages. What can gay and lesbian couples teach straight ones about living in harmony? Um, she is also a Schwartz, Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation on, on Lee from the Post. Jonathan Rauch is a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution, although I guess you're known for many, many other reasons beyond that. Um, I, you recently wrote Denial about living in the closet for the first 25 years of your life. And I just was browsing, looking at it on Amazon, and it was described as equal parts Oliver Sacks and George Orwell with with moments of Woody Allen. So a <laughs> really interesting combination um, uh, in, in talking about those, those issues. Um, OK, so to build on some of the themes from the last panel, I think this panel is going to be quite happy because everybody um, uh, sort of is, is approaching same-sex marriage from a supportive perspective as well as thought-provoking. So to, to, to focus on, on the thought-provoking, um, in thinking about same-sex marriage and the reasons why same-sex marriage has been so important to many people within the LGBT community as well as outside of the LGBT community, um, Suzanne Goldberg, who's now a law professor at Columbia, suggests that there may be three different interests in same-sex marriage. Um, first, the reasons to advocate for, and she, by the way, does not call it same-sex marriage. She just says marriage, because once same-sex couples are married, they're no different from any other couples who are married. But she suggests three different interests. Um, First, when you're married, you have access to a whole series of different material benefits. Um, second, marriage establishes equal status between same and different sex couples. And third, and this actually gets to, to Liza's article, um, it is possible that when same sex couples are able to marry, as they now are in I guess about a dozen jurisdictions, that they may be able to transform the institution of marriage, interestingly enough, an argument made from both the right and the left. 
Um, so given these three interests, having access to material benefits, equal status, transforming marriage, I want to turn it to the three of you to talk about why the right to marry is so important. Let, let's start with why the right to marry is so important and can same-sex marriage transform marriage as an institution? Anybody? Uh, I All think of you Suzanne have thought. Goldberg is wrong in <laughs> general. Um, marriage does not bring benefits. Remember when you got married, the truck full of money that pulled up on your front lawn? Uh, marriage brings responsibilities and tools for executing those responsibilities, and those are the responsibilities to look after another person for life and your kids if you have them. Marriage is primarily about building family, and I think the reason the marriage movement began in 1970, six months after Stonewall, the first gay couple tried to get married, is because we want family and the benefits of family and the things that we've been talking about all morning. I grew up in a divorced household and saw what happens when family comes apart. I came of age in the 80s and one of the reasons I was in such denial was watching what gay culture looks like in a world without family, without marriage, when sex is between strangers in the bushes or in bathrooms and your friends are dying and you can't even get in the hospital room. Often you can't even get in the country with the person you're caring about. And we came out of that and said, you know, family is good, and we want that stability and safety. Last thing, which did I mention that I have this new book out, it's an e-book. Um, um, but something I emphasize, and it's not a policy book, it's a memoir, um, is that one of the reasons I spent my first 25 years, not just in the closet, that doesn't begin to capture it, but twisting my entire personality into one massive personality disorder in order to deny even to myself the possibility I might be gay is that from a very early age, long before I knew sexual attraction, um, part of me understood that I could never get married and have a family. I didn't know why. You know, this was years before dating and all that. I just knew this was the case and that every single day, anything like an attraction or a romantic interest would push me further from a life in family and a destination for my love. The availability of marriage changes the gay and lesbian psyche, I believe, from the very earliest stage in life by letting us know there is a place in the community for us and there is a place, there is a family and a person out there waiting for us. And from the first crush and the first kiss and the first date, that is just hugely important in having a right side up life. And no, I don't think we'll transform marriage. I think it'll transform us for the most part. Uh -huh. I'm a professor, so I have to say it's complicated and things go in both <laughs> directions. Um, and my and I also would take the invitation that I think that um, Jonathan started with and other panelists have said, um, which is to speak in an emotional register. Because families are, of course, a combination of rational and emotional factors. And family law um, is, um, is a mix of trying to come up with rational rules that govern a lot of emotional and social questions. So the one thing, I, I actually think Suzanne is, Goldberg is right about a lot of things, but there is more to say. And in particular, the part that I think is worthwhile saying is that is the emotional and social thing that happens. So if you're living in a jurisdiction like California right now, where you could enter a domestic partnership and get all the rights and duties, both of marriage, but it's just not called marriage, what does that mean? And so I took this panel as being a conversation. If, in fact, we're moving toward either civil unions in Illinois and marriage in Massachusetts, or maybe the same thing all over the country, um, what does the word marriage do? So what does it mean when you can have all the rights and all the duties in your state and maybe at the federal level, depending on what the court does with the marriage cases in the next few weeks? Um, what does that mean? And I would speak from personal experience. I'm about to turn 50 this summer. I came out in college. I was at a women's college, so it was a lot more fun um, <laughs> to come out. And, and lesbians were not, um, you know, didn't have the experience with AIDS that, that gay guys had in the 80s. So very different situation. Um, but um, I have, 
I have the very good luck of having a midlife marriage. And for those of you who have had midlife marriages, you know what life was like before, and it is sweet. So when I am 45, I marry this um, smart, savvy Jewish lawyer. Um, I'm not Jewish. So when I marry her in Massachusetts in 2009, I marry into a Jewish family. Now, I didn't come out of the box at 45. I had other relationships. I lived with one person for 12 years. And whenever we talked about each other's families in my cohabiting relationship, we used scare quotes. And because we were both lawyers, we referred to them as outlaws instead of in-laws. And there's a jokey quality because you're not quite really family. In this book that I'm writing, I've really struggled about how to talk about a range of families. And Jonathan was suggesting that marriage is the pinnacle. And I think it is the thing that more people want and more people do than anything else, and law should honor that. But I also think that love comes in different packages. And when he mentions AIDS in the 80s and early 90s, before the drugs um, kicked in and became available, there were caregiving networks that were deeply family-like. I'm not sure what law does with that, and scholars are working on that. What I would say is having now married into a Jewish family, I'm still not Jewish, but I'm the one who makes sure that there's a challah at 6 o'clock on Friday night. And I'm the one who wants our 9-year-old to know the Jewish prayers in case he wants to be Jewish. Whether he is going to be, I don't know. We also go to the Unitarian Church on Sundays. So it's much more choice. And that choice, I think, is really where I think I see family law going and, there, and society. There are just more options. And there's more visibility. And I think what we're moving toward, and what I hope we're moving toward, is a morally neutral range of relationships where marriage still has a, a special fizz. And it's because you're really promising, I'll stick with you for better or worse. And there's something to that socially, economically, um, financially, um, legally, and that matters. Um, but I also think it's special because every culture but one on the face of the earth has marriage. And to signal out, to single out one group of people and say there's something so creepy about you that you cannot enter this status, that socially carries a, carries a big um, burden. What am I supposed to say now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I uh, no. I, I actually will argue. I'm gonna. I'll be contentious and argue a little bit. Um, and just to say, actually, to be personal, um, I too have divorced parents. Um, I actually learned one time when I was interviewing Betsy Stevenson, and she was uh, saying that the height of divorce was in 1979, which I didn't know. Um, that's when my parents divorced. So I come from the you know generation who experienced, I think, widespread divorce. Uh, parents, and I'm in a heterosexual marriage, um, and I have two te teenage children. Uh, and I do argue in my Atlantic piece that, that same-sex marriage will change marriage. I argue that marriage is a changing institution. It has been stable. You know, it still exists. It's existed for, um, for centuries, uh, but it's changed enormously. Um, it used to be something where, where children could be betrothed to each other in order to unite noble houses or great estates. Um, in some parts of the world, children still are betrothed, but in general, we reject that now. Uh, No-fault divorce changed, changed marriage uh, in, ter in terms of recognizing that it no longer had to be a lifelong and permanent union. Um, the Married Women's Property Rights uh, Acts, giving women the right to own property in marriage or own the right to their wages, that changed marriage. So I think marriage is going to continue to change. It sounds like it's going to continue to exist. And I would say, you know, why wouldn't same-sex marriage change marriage? And the argument that I make is, in any number of ways, I mean, listening to these heartfelt and incredibly informed um, testimonials to why marriage is important, I think this is the first time culturally that we've heard this argument made in 30 or 40 years as to why marriage is valid and important. And, uh, and what I saw in my reporting for The Atlantic, and I wouldn't overstate this, but yet it's something that I saw, 
in churches in DC and Maryland that can do same sex, that can perform same sex marriages now, and not all churches can because not all denominations permit it yet. But the churches here who are doing it are seeing what you might call a marriage promotion effect um, or a social contagion effect. I mean, we know that happiness now is, is, is socially contagious. We know that divorce might be socially contagious. And what these churches are seeing is that marriage might be socially contagious. So I interviewed a, um, a, a pastor in Maryland who had gotten used to doing no marriages a year or one marriage. And she has eight marriages this year. Three of them are same-sex marriage. Five of them are heterosexual marriages. So they're, they're anecdotally reporting um, you know, more marriages, that, that people, that their congregations are excited. They love you know, going to same-sex marriages. Uh, Rob Hardy's, who is, I think, your pastor, made the great analogy that you know, we like seeing love that overcomes obstacles. That's the, you know, that's the sort of driving narrative of romantic comedies, be they Shakespeare or Hollywood. And what we're getting to see now is love that has overcome obstacles and is coming together. We feel really good about that. So um, that's one thread. But I think also what, what the studies show is that in same-sex relationships, there is more domestic, uh, there's more egalitarianism, sort of division of labor. And, and so uh, because couples have to, to figure out from the start who's going to do this, who's going to work, who's going to earn, or, or are we both going to earn, who's going to cook, who's going to do this, there's not the sort of falling back on stereotype that still exists in heterosexual marriage. I mean, we know that women, even when they're working, they still do more housework in their relationships. And, when I would make this argument, often people in same-sex relationships would go, yeah, that's true, but it's not going to trickle over. I mean, even if it's true that these unions are more egalitarian, and that's not always easier. It's not always easy to have to kind of hammer out who's going to do what. But the idea that maybe they'll just exist in parallel. But I was, I was very interested to interview priests and ministers and therapists who argued, well, actually, I counsel married couples differently now because I counsel same-sex couples. Um, so the dean of the National Cathedral in Washington made this argument to me. I counsel same-sex couples. I see them hammering out from the start. You know, what are we going to, what are we going to do? Whose in-laws are we going to uh, spend the holidays with? Um, who's going to do what? And seeing what he called the radical egalitarianism makes him push heterosexual couples harder on who's going to be responsible for contraception. Oh, it's going to be the wife? Why should it be the wife? Why shouldn't it be both of you? Who's going to handle the money? So he feels like he's challenging heterosexual couples in a way that he hadn't before because of his experience counseling same-sex couples. So those are the arguments that I make that actually I think that it will change marriage. Just a clarification before we move on. Um, I, I love that, and I love that about the article. Um, the question you asked was, will same-sex marriage transform straight marriage? And there's a lot of space between transforming oh, hmm. and influencing. Oh, interesting. I think it okay, will influence, and, and I think the influences will, inf and I've long argued, will largely be for the better. One reason will be supporting the cult cultural norm of marriage. But I don't think what you're seeing with these couples is a desire to somehow transform the whole institution. I think they're joining it, improving it, and working out some of the wrinkles. I also think there's an interesting question about cause and effect. So there's a story you could tell that because of these handsome gay guys getting married, everybody's, you know, it's a trend. I like trend better than contagion because contagion sounds like an illness and a trend just seems like, ah, oh, doesn't everybody want to do that? It looks so good and shiny. Um, so my question is about cause and effect. One of the, the things that's been coming up on all these panels are big macro changes in the economy. With the growth of the service economy, there aren't so many jobs for um, working class guys in the manufacturing economy and marriage um, uh, reduces. And then in the richer sex, there's so much talk about the renegotiation of the basic deal between spouses. And more guys are um, doing more home, um, home making and more women are doing more of the um, wage earning. And I wonder whether there's something that uh, the legal scholar Derek Bell called interest convergence coming into play. That one reason that the heterosexual marriages are so interested in straight marriages, because there are very few of us there are between 130 and 150,000 same-sex marriages. There are 60 million cross-sex marriages. So how can 150,000 people influence 60 million? One possibility might be the 60 million is on their way. They're looking for a good reason to do it. 
and we're a nice we're a nice reason to do it because I would love I, I talked to her when she was doing the um, to Liza when she was doing the article and I thought really really are gay people really that powerful and I said really I'd love to be this powerful but I don't think we are I read her article and and she convinced me um, that in fact there's a link but I think it might be going in both directions that heterosexual marriage is already changing and as two grooms on the top of a cake or two brides on a on the top of a cake just give a shorthand for people to talk about changing gender roles. And, and in fact, some of the arguments in some of the briefs supporting same-sex marriage are that marriage has already changed dramatically right. for many of the reasons right. um, uh, uh, that Liza was listing, um, uh, beginning or primarily because of women's increasing status in marriage, but then in terms of no-fault divorce, et cetera. So, so marriage itself as an institution has changed dramatically. And then the question, thank you, Jonathan, for that nice um, uh, transformation versus Liza's carefully written subheading of what can same-sex couples actually teach what Martha's calling cross-sex couples. So I mean, I'd like I'd like to ask sort of a little bit more Not that about cross about it. I yes. guess Suzanne called them different sex. Different couples. sex. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'd, I'd like to explore more about yeah what 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 can be what can those of us in different sex marriages learn from same sex marriages. Uh, yeah, and I would just say when I was doing my interviewing, I talked to Gary Gates, who's at the Williams Institute at UCLA, and he made that argument to me. No, it's not going to change marriage. Marriage had to change first. Society had to change first before we would be admitted mm -hmm. to it. So all that social work, all that change about, you know, what is a family it had, to, had to happen before, you know, to prepare the way. So that, that argument um, was made, and he was quite, uh, you know, eloquent about it. Uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, in terms of what else we're going to learn, I mean, one of the one of the interesting um, now that we're doing studies that show sort of are, are some phenomena maybe different in cross sex households, opposite house, opposite sex yeah. households, and same sex households, but -sex, some some will right? be the same. Yes. I mean, there's what well, we we talked about divorce, and one of the things we didn't talk about is the fact that in in heterosexual marriages, women are more likely to initiate divorce than men are. And so why is that? I mean, that's really interesting to know, even if they're going to be economically disadvantaged in the divorce. And so research from Northern Europe, where same sex marriage has been in place longer than it has here, is showing that lesbian couples are more likely to dissolve than gay male couples. So is it that women actually are just really picky about their relationships? Um, you know, are we the threat to marriage, actually? Uh, and so as we're able to kind of build this scholarship, uh, it will be interesting, interesting to, <laughs> to, to figure out, you know, but also I think if, as I say in the piece, if at the end it turns out, you know, that sort of the struggles are actually the same and the arguments are quite similar and the, and the, the difficulties and the joys are, are similar, then maybe we learn that, that everything that we've been sort of thinking the past 30 years about the war between men and women and the sort of, you know, the, you just don't understand, et cetera, that maybe it's just two people trying to live together, you know, for a pretty long period of time. Uh, I think the data, and you could tell me if the if the latest is true on this. At the last I checked, if you look at the percentage of households where um, one person is working full time, um, they're raising children. That one person is working full time and the other is at home full time. There's the it's 25 percent of both same sex couples raising children and different sex couples raising children. So that it is that there's some 25% of people who have enough money and the resources to do it and somebody who's willing to, to have that stark version of the of wage earning and homemaking. Specialization. Specialization, yeah, There is right. specialization in same-sex households right. with children. Right, and so children. in that sense, yeah. that's not going to be that different, but right. there are different norms. So it makes me think of growing up gay, coming of age gay, equality is sort of in the air we breathe. So to have a relationship that feels hierarchical is kind of would go against the grain, I think, of most gay folks' day-to-day um, -day life. And so it might be that norms of equality come in through the rhetoric. But again, I think it's only if the, may, if, it's only if the 60 million are in the mood to hear the message that it'll be heard. Because I'd love to think we were that powerful. I just don't think we're that powerful.
I suspect our influence may be at its peak right around now because as we start marrying and settling down and becoming a routine part of life, I'm not sure we'll get all that much attention. We'll just become married couples like everyone else. Um, one thing I took away from your article, Liza, is that a lot of what was seeming to make these same-sex marriages thrive was careful consideration of many of the details and an egalitarian spirit. Um, so here's a politically incorrect question to which I don't think we know the answer yet. One thing we could learn from that is that straight couples can copy that and benefit from it. Another thing that might turn out to be the case, though, is that same-sex male marriages don't have heterosexual men in them. Um, I don't think... <laughs> yes, some of them might, but I don't not a lot. Think, I don't think we know yet how transferable the dynamics of gay people and gay relationships are going to turn out in a straight world. Um, I, I, think, I think that's a very open question. Yeah, I'll just say um, just two things to that. Uh, one interesting, Pepper Schwartz, sociologist, was one of the first people who thought, you know what, if I study uh, straight relationships and same-sex relationships, I can learn something about um, what's true of men and women or what's true of straight versus same-sex. And one of the things she found is that many of the, and this was true in my reporting too, many of the men who were in same-sex relationships had come from straight marriages because they had entered into straight marriages, I think, out of a desire for family, out of um, maybe not being out yet. And when she asked the guys in the um, same-sex relationships, well, actually, they were helping each other with housework. Did you help your wife with housework back when you were in the straight marriage? And she said they invariably said no. Um, and so there was more egalitarianism going on when men were partnered with men than when men had been partnered with women, which I thought was interesting. Um, and, and I think, just, in, just to, again, to sort of make the argument that people are paying more attention than you think, uh, another, another interview I did for this piece was with a woman in a heterosexual marriage whose husband is a litigator and they have two small children. She was in a PhD program and her, and this is very familiar to all of us, uh, her husband was working such insane work hours as a litigator in a major Washington practice that she finally dropped out of her PhD program to be a stay-at-home mom. She was very, you know, very attentive to her children, but also clearly very conflicted about her choice. And she is friends with a lesbian couple, and they're both attorneys. And one has made the decision to stay home as well. And so on the one hand, she felt because there's so much anxiety around these choices and so much comp competition in terms of parenting. She felt vindicated because this progressive lesbian, you know, egalitarian couple had made the same specialization decision that she had. Uh, so that made her feel good about herself, but she also felt as though within their specialization they were more egalitarian. So the working attorney was coming home earlier and more present when she was home, so she felt like their family was sort of functioning better. So she was feeling simultaneously vindicated because they had made the same choice, but anxious because she actually felt like their family was more chill than hers. So it was just, it was really interesting to have that conversation. And those will be the interesting conversations so people are if, in fact, the court and the rest of society goes where it, we think it will be, where same-sex marriage gets recognized, and then it becomes just plain marriage. Then we have marriage and everybody else. And so one way to do right. that is yeah. to think not so much. I do think the label same-sex is going to drop the way interracial dropped yeah. shortly after the Loving decision in 1967, and it will just be marriage. And, and what I would argue for is that marriage could be treated like plan A. Most people do it. Most people want it. It's the most common option. But lots of people opt for plan B. The, most, the second most common couple household is a cohabiting household. So that we will have a place where perhaps because of the equality um, rhetoric that comes into marriage, that there will be more openness to giving cohabitants more of the definition of family. There won't yeah. so much be an idea that there's one family, one kind of way to be a family, and everybody else is just a stranger. Just for the record, um, to put a different perspective on the table, I very much hope that that does not happen. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence now that supports the proposition that particularly for kids, but also for grown-ups, marriage brings something important to the table that cohabitation doesn't. It brings a whole set of social networks and expectations that fortify that relationship and a whole lot of social resources with it. They're stronger than cohabitations. They're more durable. Married people are healthier and happier and better off financially. You can do longitudinal studies on the same people and get this. So although there are a lot of things we need to do for a lot of family structures, I think it's important that marriage should remain on a pedestal. I have no problem 
problem with being on a pedestal, but you can have a sliding scale. So it doesn't have to be pedestal and the basement. It can be pedestal and then some stairs and then I don't know what the basement's going to be. <laughs> but I think that, that what it is is I teach contracts. And in contract law, we talk about reasonable expectations. People shouldn't have to become experts in the law. The law should be what most people reasonably expect it to be. So similarly, you could reasonably expect marriage is going to give you this many rights and duties. And cohabitation, I think you would reasonably expect gives you some, but not all. And then, you know, with your babysitter, you probably don't have a lot. You have fair labor rules, but not family. And I think that's really where, I don't think yeah, it's an on-off switch. And I'm that's where against, I think we get into trouble. I'm actually against sliding scales because they're too easy to slip down. I'd like to see a fairly clear distinction between this one very special promise people make with all that we invest in it. You know, the ceremonies and the vows and the rings and the family and the in-laws. That's a very special promise to care for someone for life. Um, and I think we need that social infrastructure that says, yeah, there's lots of other things, but those really are plan B. Plan A is really special. So I'd like to see some, some real demarcation there. But maybe we're talking about degrees and extents here. It's actually, I mean, it's fascinating to think about whether or not, I mean, how we should think about the plan B, the, the non-marital the non status. But I will also say that, that as we were preparing for the panel, I had a conversation with Martha in which I talked about, well, we don't really care if people get married or divorced. And she said, oh, no, marriage is incredibly important um, for many of the reasons, Jonathan, that, that you were identifying. Um, I think it's time to go for questions, if, which I'm assuming just because I saw you first. Oh, yay. Um, hi, I'm Sam from The Nation. And um, I saw, I've been reading a lot about. Oh, sorry, a microphone is coming oh, yeah, towards yeah. you. I, I'm loud too. So it's one of us good. Um, I've been reading some um, interesting articles about online dating, and I've noticed that they're, they're pretty heteronormative. I mean, I'm straight and I met my boyfriend on JDate, but then I have a lot of uh, guy friends who meet. Um, their boyfriends on Grinder, which you would think wouldn't result I'm in like, <laughs> like yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. But they then they actually language. have these like very stable, long-term, you know, relationships in college and things with people they met on Grinder and stuff, and that's not talked about as much. And I was wondering if there's uh, there's been a discussion that any of you are aware of about what the impact of meeting your long-term partner or eventually your spouse on on a, an online dating website has on the duration of the marriage, because some articles say that like. If you online date, you always think there's something else out there that might be better right, and right, that you have right. the other options, you're less likely to stay with someone. So it's, it's, I'm just interested in sort of that and that, I mean, obviously kind of dovetails with the previous panel too. So but when yeah. there, there was something in the post yesterday yeah. in the health section on precisely this issue of are online dating relationships just as stable or more stable? And yeah, I mean, there's, there's, the research shows that they might be more stable, but then of course, as is always true whenever you're talking about research. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, go, go ahead. No, that's all. Yeah. I, I interviewed one married couple for my piece who had met online dating, but that's purely anecdotal, and they seem to have quite a stable um, relationship going forward. I actually think that the way I, the part I find particularly compelling on the online world is the way family is getting redefined on the online world. So I first heard about this in Israel, but also there was an article in the New York Times several months ago about online registries to find a co-parent. So if you want to find a, a dad and you're a single mother and you, and you want to find someone who's tall, who's interested in math and science and, you know, easy to get along with, there's more and more of that. And so I think that because people can find each other, the internet um, allows a venue for forming all different kinds of, um, kinds of partnerships. And then the law's job and society's job is to figure out what bucket to put those, those partnerships in. There, there may also be an adjustment problem, just as we're sort of, I, I mean, the internet is changing or has changed our lives. And so just as we used to meet at college reunion gatherings, now we just meet on the internet. And so there's an argument that nothing should be any different just because of, of how you've met through that kind of a matching service. Yeah. Wendy. Um, I just, I had two, two comments. Um, uh, one thing that, that you were talking about, um, will same-sex marriage sort of challenge ideas of hierarchy in marriage? And what I've found is that 
a lot of straight couples get married and they don't have the same expectations for marriage, but they don't know it because they haven't mm -hmm. discussed it. And it isn't just about who's going to do the dishes. It's about things like independence versus interdependence, how important work is versus family, you know, how much time we spend with our kids. Mm -hmm. So I think that these same-sex mar sex marriages might make straight people start to say, wait a minute, do we, what do we agree on? What are we expecting here mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a broader way and not just hierarchy? So I think that that could be a really positive influence. Um, and the other comment I wanted to make is that uh, there's a marriage researcher, Andrew Sherlin, that some, somebody else mentioned, and he talks about marriage losing its, um, that, it's, that it has a status and it's sparkly, but it doesn't have a lot of real world value because you can live together, you can have children, you can have sex, you can support yourself, all these things that don't require marriage. And so he's sort of saying, I don't know, will it last at all other than as a, as a status symbol because we don't need it. But it's really interesting to me to hear both of you talk about, well, this family. And this didn't, I haven't seen this in his work, like that, that then you feel connected to a family and that you don't get that family support and social support unless you're married. It's just not something I've heard of that's interesting. And he also talks about that marriage has become a marker of prestige. So if you put it too much on a pedestal and sort of worship and it's this incredible religion, it has to be everything. And, and that, that people don't enter into it if they don't think that they can afford to enter into it. The idea of being sort of young and foolish and just starting out, then you think, well, I can't get married yet because I, I'm, not, I, I'm not worthy of this, of this grace. So he, he sort of, I think, cautions against the idea of putting marriage on a pedestal because then people think they have to be arrived, successful, affluent people before they can actually partake of it. Another cautionary note there is remember, um, when we talk about you know, gay couples doing all this understanding and negotiating, we can't just drift into marriage. Mm -hmm. To get married and be gay in America is a very, very big deal. And most of these couples have been together for a long time. They've had to negotiate relationships in a world without any social support or guidance at all. Um, that may change as we get into a world where gay people, too, can just sort of drift into marriage. Right. So the first cohort is going to be people who probably have been in long-term relationships have been waiting for this day. And then, then the demographics I'm one, I'm may one change. I'm one of those. Yeah. yeah. Dan? Um, I don't know, question or comment, but as someone who's in a same-sex marriage, I've been with my husband for 11 years, who happens to be Jewish, and I'm obviously Christian. Um, <laughs> where, what, what I have found is that um, the population at large I find very supportive. Where I don't find support often is in the gay community. Um, in, the fact, in the sense that we both have a colonial house in Connecticut with a dog, and uh, a very, that's what we want. And we want, we want a monogamous relationship, we want um, all of that, and I just sometimes hear, and I have to defend myself, not to society, but to the gay community, that I haven't just taken hook, line, and sinker, the heteronormative uh, norm that's been shoved down my throat. Maybe, maybe there's mm -hmm. part of that, but can't I have that too? And I just feel like sometimes the gay community is not. Can I ask you, would it be a fair guess that most of the people who, who hit you with that stuff are older? and not younger? Yes, absolutely. This is generational. Definitely. When I say gay marriage is certainly transforming us, it transforms us, I think. It, it's, it's a big deal. It's a, the Stonewall generation and older thought, you know, why would we want any of that? That's what we're rebelling against. And when I did a book tour promoting marriage, I found myself again and again facing this generation trying to justify why marriage is a good thing. I never have those conversations mm -hmm. with, with gay and lesbian people in their 20s and 30s. They don't even ask that. Um, uh, yeah, in the pink. There's also someone who's been wonderfully persistent in a, in a gray sweater do, in the back. Do you know what I, I think I'd like to do since we only, have, we only have two minutes? Why don't people just, why doesn't everybody keep, keep up your hands and we'll just go around and you can ask questions and we won't respond. Yeah, okay, okay. good. Um, I just had a serious concern with this idea about putting marriage on a pedestal. Um, in my experience, m marriage is put on too high of a pedestal in that a lot of people are in very unhappy, um, contentious households where uh, their spouse might be abusive or uh, they're extremely unhappy or they're not living the life that they want to lead. Um, I was just interested, uh, I, why is it, um, so when we think of gay marriage, sometimes we think about um, uh, realizing 
this um, pinnacle of achievement and happiness. And um, it, I just was wondering, uh, do you think that the challenges for uh, gay individuals getting married are the same as those for straight individuals getting married? And are those challenges and are those struggles the same? Okay, let's go to the next. You said, Jonathan, there was somebody very there persistent. There it is. It's that hand in the... <laughs> I don't know if oh, you could see it from where you A couple sitting. of comments. One um, is that um, I was wondering if you, if what the panelists think about whether gay marriages have to be, same-sex marriages have to be mo model marriages. You know, having gone through all this struggle and, you know, to get the right to marry, do you then have to stay married? Do you have to have a great marriage? Do you have to have an ideal marriage? It's sort of the flip side of what you're saying about how gay marriage might actually improve the institution of marriage. Um, the woman who plays the coach on Glee, I can't remember her name, the actress, right. I, I saw in the paper right. this morning she's getting divorced, and I, and I had this response like, oh, you know, like if, if somebody else that they were getting divorced, I just think, well, so what? But somehow or other, I thought, well, gee, that's too bad. And I just sort of, there was an extra um, residence to it. The other thing is, uh, I think that, uh, going back to what Jonathan was saying, uh, uh, marriage is great if you can find a partner, but people, some people don't always find partners and they, and they still want to have a family. So we have lots of women and increasingly men who are having children who are, going, who are becoming um, co-parents. My son who's gay has never had a long-term relationship, but he wanted to have a child. He has a daughter through, with a co-parent and uh, it's not working out ideally for complicated reasons, but the daughter is great and he's delighted and he has a family. So I just think we need to also understand that the variety of families doesn't always involve marriage. We're, we're out of time, but, but maybe one, if, if people, if they're like two hands that are really persistent really quickly. <laughs> Speak really that, fast. Yeah. I just want to drill down what Martha said. Uh, are, we often see social dynamics that are actually economic dynamics, right? That, that marriage as an economic institution was sort of an almost necess necessity in the 13th century. Less so now. Where are we going? How do those two curves relate to each other? Marriage and the economy and the economic structure in the next 50 years. One more. Yes. Thank you. A really great panel. I was wondering if you could provide a bit of a historical perspective on marriage. And I was thinking of Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Hearts of Men, where she argues that not only were the 40s and 50s uh, filled with the social conventions that girls had to stay at home until they got married, whereas men were forced to enter in heterosexual marriage even if they were not heterosexual out of fear of being accused and extreme homophobia. I, I want to, well. Do you want a quick response or are we I, I, up? We're, we're completely, yeah. we're, we're yeah. way over time, so I want to thank all of you for all of your questions and I want to thank right. the three yeah. of you for a really, really great yeah. and wonderful yeah. and fascinating and heartfelt panel. Yeah. So thank, thank you. 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 Thank you